And let's see another paper for image denoising. So the idea is the same, rather than the same as before, rather than learning a fully nonlinear function from one input image to the denoised image, you can actually learn the residual. And the residual image is learning this one is much simpler. So it's the same idea as before. And what is the math behind it? There is a clean image, there is a noisy observation. You could have additive white Gaussian noise. This is the assumption that other methods make, but you don't have to make this assumption because you are going beyond the Gaussian denoiser. So you don't have to make this assumption. But then the idea is that uh, you can actually learn the residual mapping rather than putting your network on F that's mapping Y to X. Y is the noisy version, X is the clean image. You can put it on uh, the residual mapping and try to learn the residual. And you change your loss function to learning the residual. So that's just the math to give you why your data is gonna be YI minus XI. And we know that that's just the residual. And then we are gonna learn the residual. And these are some qualitative examples. And apparently the method is not that sensitive to stochastic gradient descent or Adam or other choices of optimizers. You can denoise it. For instance, this could be a, the output of a ray tracing algorithm. You have your 3D environment, you do your ray tracing, and that's going to be your image. You don't want to show that to your customers. So you first denoise it, and then you, you show that. So what is cool is that, and we had this discussion, that what is the relationship between denoising and super resolution? They are, or deblocking, they are the same in the eyes of this algorithm. They are, they are all just denoising. And you can see that's the image on portions of it. You are doing Gaussian, you are adding Gaussian noise. On portions of it, you are reducing the resolution. And on portions of it, you are doing deblocking. You are compressing it in JPEG format. These are the residuals. You can see that the noise pattern is totally different from the Gaussian noise pattern. This is definitely non-Gaussian. This is Gaussian, and this is uh, something different. And then the same network is going to denoise it. And here is another example. Any questions? In, in those two figures at the top, when it says uh, with or without RL, is that referring to some kind of reinforcement learning they're using? Uh, no, it's residual. Oh. This stands for, R stands for residual. I think so they're so. just looking at using their method versus not using the residual yes and using okay i see and then the other one is with batch norm or without batch norm. yeah okay thanks so apparently with residual and with batch norm the red curves are doing the best if you think that uh, peak signal to noise ratio is the correct metric any other questions this could also be used in um like you were talking about zoom and i know um like uh skype does the same thing when they're doing video compression it's usually lossy and that's why you end up with like a blurred video feed. And so couldn't you put this on the back end, like on my computer after receiving a video stream from you as blurring or, or, or noise and then do this to it? Uh, yes, before I answer your question, we are out of time. The ones who want to leave and have other meetings, they can leave and the ones who want to stay and ask questions, I'll be around. Uh, yes, to answer your question, there is actually a new paper by NVIDIA and they claim that their method of uh, compressing images is much better than doing it the normal way. I don't know whether they're using what they're using, but yes, you are right. You can use it for that application, for Zoom, for Skype, for et cetera, for WebEx. The only other time I've seen denoising is with um, like Gaussian smoothing for time series. And I know there then you have the problem that if you did want to have something with a step in it, um, like if the signal naturally had a step, it would then lose that sharpness. And I'm guessing that's the same thing that happens with images, like this image of the castle where it goes from the roof to the sky, there should be a very steep edge. And um, did they talk at all about like the, the behavior of edges in this case and with this algorithm? Like, is it, is it better in that regard too? Uh, I think the previous one was doing a good job with the edges and sharps. Look at this. This is really yeah. sharp at the edge. Yeah. Oh, and then this brought up the one last question I had, which was looking at these um, these errors versus depth 
charts, it looks like there's um, an early like optimum around like a depth of 10 ish or 12 ish, and then it drops and then it comes back up later. And it makes me think of a lot of these like early stopping algorithms when you're doing training and you, you stop when you hit a plateau and start getting worse. And how would you uh, know that things aren't going to get better later? Or like in this case, it seems like, um, like if you, if you go up to a depth of 12 and then things start getting worse as you go up to 15, it's hard to believe that things would get better later on. I think you are confusing the depth with the training steps. For early stopping, you, you're actually going to look, you're going to be patient a little bit before you stop. Mm-hmm. You're going to follow your training, your evaluation metric on your validation data set, and you're going to watch it for a while. And if it's going down, you're going to stop it. Yeah. Or if it's going up, depending on what you want to do, of your metric. But here it's a, it's a different story. It's about the depth. So yeah. after the earliest stopping, whatever trick that they are using, it's after that, they come up with a single number for peak signal to noise ratio and they are, dep- they are reporting it. And the other thing is that uh, these analyses on deep neural networks are not that stable as you want them to be compared to other methods. Yes, they are going to go down, they're going to go up, but you look at the trend. And you do it for different scales, for instance, scale factors. So these systematic studies depend on the initial configuration of your weights and biases. They depend on the random seed on your computer, et cetera. The other question I had was looking at these, um, you were talking about these like dead feature maps in the top left, the things that are blacked out. Um, that means that when you do back propagation, once they're zeroed out, they have zero gradient and they're never going to change from zero, right? That's hard to say because that depends on your batch. Maybe a different batch goes in and then they're going to activate again. Okay. Is it true in a general sense um, that the, the, the feature maps, which are closer to zero or uniformly zero, aren't they always just going to generate zero activation? And so therefore the... Um... Not really. This, uh, these feature maps that you're seeing, they mm-hmm. go onto this image. They depend on that image. Mm. change the image you're gonna get zero somewhere else got it so those are those are not the f- values of the weights but the values of the activation once the image has pushed through yes okay but if you were looking at the weights if you were looking at the 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 weights of one of the layers and they were all zeros is it true then that they're gonna stay zero forever not necessarily okay no because the rate might be zero but the gradient of the loss with respect to that weight might be on zero, non-zero. Got, got it, yeah. That's going to push you out of zero. So you need to look at the grade. Yeah, okay, thank you. That, that's, that's all I've got. Any other questions?